on, everyone? My name is Jamon McKinney, or you can just call me Juice because that is my nickname. Welcome, everyone, to the Juice Alert, episode number 47 for you, ladies and gentlemen out there. If you have not subscribed to the Juice Alert already, be sure to do that right about now. You will not regret it. You can, of course, find me on YouTube as well as podcasting platforms. That includes Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, all that great stuff. If you're listening on podcasting platforms and you are feeling kind, be sure to leave me a good rating and review. It definitely helps me out right here on the show. And same thing on YouTube. If you're listening on YouTube, be sure to smash that like button right about now. Like I said, it definitely helps me out right here on the channel. I have about 18 topics lined up for you guys today. We're going to talk about Aaron Rodgers and his kind of little, not necessarily feud, but I guess battle with the Green Bay Packers organization. You know, I always feel that Aaron Rodgers has always had to overcome the incompetence of the Green Bay Packers organization. Green Bay is not a dumpster fire of an organization, but I don't believe in their philosophy overall. We'll talk about a lot of those things. We'll also talk about Sam Darnold, if he can turn his career around with the Carolina Panthers. Teddy Bridgewater was just recently traded to the Denver Broncos. What does that mean for the Broncos and their playoff hopes this year? What does that mean for the former second-round pick, Drew Locke, that they picked about two years ago to be their franchise quarterback, potentially. Is Drew Locke, you know, is his future, is his, you know, time pretty much over in Denver? We'll talk about that. I'll tell you why the New York Jets should not draft Zach Wilson. We'll also talk about the Washington football team. A lot of good things to talk about on the show today. But before I do get started, I just wanted to say you all you all can follow me on social media, whether it be on Instagram and Twitter. The links to all of my social media accounts are in the description of this episode. Okay, so I want to kick off the show today by talking about the NFL draft because obviously the draft is rapidly approaching all of us. Now, several days ago, I released my official 2021 NFL mock draft. I went through I went through all 32 picks and I told you all what I personally would do. And with the draft, you know, being almost here, I'm going to make a couple of changes to my mock draft. I'm going to give you my official final 2021 NFL mock draft. The bad news is I'm not going to do all 32 picks just because I feel like the top 10, the top 15 picks are the most relevant picks. So I'm going to tell you in the top ten, which picks from my initial mock draft I would I would I would change based on what I talked about last time. So let's go over my initial mock draft from last time, the top ten. So and number one overall, by the way, this is what I personally would do. I played the role of general manager. I wasn't trying to predict what teams were going to do. This is what I would do. So in my initial mock draft, I had Trevor Lawrence going to the Jaguars. Justin Fields going to the Jets, Trey Lance going to the 49ers, Kyle Pitts going to the Falcons, Penny Sewell going to the Bengals, Devontae Smith going to the Dolphins, Jamar Chase going to the Lions, Patrick Sertain going to the Panthers, Jeremiah Owusa Kwamora going to the Denver Broncos, and J.C. Horn going to the Dallas Cowboys. Okay, so that's my that was my initial top 10. Here's my revised an official final mock draft based on what I would do. There are a couple of changes. You know, let's talk about it. Let's start off with the first three picks. You know, Trevor Lawrence going to the Jaguars, Justin Fields going to the Jets, and Trey Lance going to the 49ers. I believe these are the three most talented quarterbacks in this entire draft, and I could see a scenario where all where all three of those guys end up becoming great franchise quarterbacks. Now, maybe that's possible, maybe it's not, but when it comes to Trevor Lawrence, comparing him to Justin Fields and Trey Lance, I believe that he has the least potential to bust. While he may not quite have the upside of a Justin Fields or a Trey Lance, even though you could argue his upside is higher, I think his upside is very similar, but his floor is much, much higher than those guys. So anytime I could get a guy with an extremely high floor and very high upside as well, I'm not going to pass on that guy. I, I consider Trevor Lawrence a generational talent. People compare him to Peyton Manning and John Elway in the past. I'm not going to do that, but I'm not going to be the guy that passes on a generational talent in Trevor Lawrence 
I'm definitely going to turn that card in with no hesitation. And then, like I said, Justin Fields and Trey Lance to me, listen, I'm not the biggest Mac Jones fan, even though I do like what Mac Jones brings to the table. I shouldn't say I'm not a big Mac Jones fan. It's just one of those things where I believe in Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields, and Trey Lance's talent more so than a Mac Jones and a Zach Wilson. And I think Justin Fields, he'll be able to handle that New York media, you know, and handle the spotlight with the Jets. The Jets need a significant upgrade over what Sam Darnold was, and I believe Justin Fields is that guy. I would take him over Trey Lance just simply because I think he's much more NFL ready at this point. And while I'm willing to develop a quarterback, sometimes when you try to develop a quarterback, it doesn't work, you know. But Trey Lance, he goes to San Francisco. It'd be a slam slam dunk move for the 49ers. Trey, Trey Lance has everything you look for in a great franchise quarterback. His processor, his arm strength, his mobility, decision making. He'd be a great pick for the 49ers. And like I said in the past, I believe the Falcons should draft a quarterback if Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields, or Trey Lance are on the board. But Kyle Pitts is available. And I don't think Zach Wilson or Mac Jones are talented enough to take this high. I'd rather build around Matt Ryan for another couple of years. So Kyle Pitts, he'd be a great fit in that offense. People are arguing he might be the best player in the draft. Now, a couple of changes at 5, 6, and 7. I'm on the Jamar Chase to the Cincinnati Bengals hype train officially now. It took me a while to get on that hype train, but listen, here's the thing. I love Penny Sewell, and I do believe Penny Sewell would be a great fit for the Dolphins at number 6. So that's why I have him going to the Miami Dolphins. I believe that Tua Tungvaloa is a quarterback that needs protection to go through his reads and scan the field. He's had injuries in the past. He's not the most mobile guy. So I need to protect Tua Tungvaloa. I can get another wide receiver or another playmaker at number 18 overall in this draft or later in the draft. I already signed Will Fuller. So Penny Sewell, to me, makes the most sense for the Dolphins. And this offensive line class is super-duper deep. So if I'm Cincinnati, I'm going to address my offensive line issues later in the draft. And I'm not going to pass on an opportunity to draft Jamar Chase, a guy that had a special connection with Joe Burrow at LSU a year ago. I'm a big believer in Joe Burrow, and I believe Jamar Chase can change the Cincinnati Bengals offense more than Penne Sewell can, at least initially. And I do believe, like I said, you can address the offensive line later. So I have Jamar Chase going to the Bengals. I'm officially on that hype train. I'm willing to take that risk and pass on the offensive lineman. Devontae Smith has seven to the Lions. They have one of the worst wide receiver cores in all football right now. Jared Goff desperately needs weapons. So I go with Devontae Smith. I, I think he's a, a phenomenal route runner. He's a guy that I believe has star potential. And I think he's going to do some good things in Detroit if, you know, used the right way and things of that nature. And the last couple of picks are defensive players. At number eight overall, I got Patrick Sertain going to the Panthers. I believe the Carolina Panthers need another defensive back to really complete that defensive unit. I think Patrick Sertain can be a number one defensive back in the NFL one day. He'd be a great pick. Jeremiah Owusa Kwamora is a playmaking linebacker at the Denver Broncos. Desperately need in the middle of their defense. Vic Vangio loves to move around his linebackers. And listen, you're in a division with Patrick Mahomes. And Justin Herbert, you need dynamic players that are versatile, that can rush the passer, that can tackle in open space and cover guys downfield. I think Jeremiah owusu Komora is a perfect fit for the Broncos. And last but not least, J.C. Horn to the Cowboys. The Cowboys have a pretty good offense with healthy, but that secondary is not very good. They need a bona fide playmaker at the cornerback position. J.C. Horn is long. He's lengthy. He reminds me a little bit of Richard Sherman, even though I'm not going to go that far as far as comparing him to Richard Sherman, but he's long, he's lengthy, he has great instincts, and he has good enough ball skills to, to the point where I'm comfortable drafting him high enough at number 10 overall. He'd be a great pick for the Cowboys. So there you have it right there. That's my official, you know, top 10 mock draft, you know, for 2021. Trevor Lawrence, the quarterback Clemson goes to the Jaguars. Justin Fields, quarterback out of Ohio State, goes to the Jets. Trey Lance, the quarterback out of North Dakota State goes to the 49ers. Kyle Pitts, the tight end slash wide receiver out of Florida, goes to the Falcons. Jamar Chase, wide receiver out of LSU to the Bengals. Penny Sewell, offensive lineman out of Oregon, goes to the Dolphins. Devontae Smith, 
Wide receiver out of Alabama, former Heisman Trophy winner. He goes to the Detroit Lions. Patrick Sertain, cornerback out of Alabama to the Carolina Panthers. Jeremiah owusa Kwamura, linebacker out of Notre Dame to the Denver Broncos. And J.C. Horn rounds out the top ten. He's a quarterback from South Carolina. So that's my that's my official mock draft right there. Draft season is very fun. And, yeah, that's pretty much how I feel about players in the top ten and where they should go. Okay, I now want to shift to the Miami Dolphins. I've been saying for about the past three months that the Miami Dolphins should seriously consider moving on from Tua Tagovailoa. Look, I've been critical of Tua Tagovailoa. I was critical of Tua Alabama, and I've been critical of Tua as a Miami Dolphin and as a starting quarterback in the NFL. You know, in college, I wasn't the biggest fan of Tua. I felt that Tua could develop one day into be, being a potential franchise quarterback, but he was often very injury-prone in college. He got injured a lot. He missed a ton of games, and he did not perform very well versus NFL-caliber defenses in college despite having A-plus wide receivers, A-plus running backs, A-plus coaching staff, A-plus offensive line. I thought he had an average arm and average mobility, and that's translated to the NFL. His arm has not gotten significantly stronger, and he's not gotten significantly more mobile, okay? And I thought that Tua could become a decent starter one day. I even at one point said Justin Herbert was going to be better than Tua coming out of college. And I was a big critic of Justin Herbert at Oregon, as you guys know, okay, the bottom line is I'm lower on Tua than most people. Now, that doesn't mean Tua can't go out there and win you football games. That doesn't mean Tua doesn't have some good traits that I like. However, I believe the Miami Dolphins should draft a quarterback, ideally Justin Fields if he's on the board, because I do believe Justin Fields is ready to play right away, or potentially if they want to take a risk, I go with Trey Lance, even though Trey Lance is not quite ready to play right away. But I think that the Miami Dolphins coaching staff can really iron some things out. Maybe they keep two on the roster to battle with a guy like Trey Lance, or or they could maybe trade for a guy like Garner Minshew to come in and sort of mentor um, Trey Lance, and then they could move on. Because I think Garner Minshew is a, a, a franchise quarterback. I just think that he's been screwed over by the Jaguars, okay? And look, the Miami Dolphins will have an opportunity to get someone like Justin Fields or Trey Lance, because here's the thing. The Jacksonville Jaguars, they're going to draft Trevor Lawrence. By all accounts, most people believe that. Most people most people believe the New York Jets are going to draft Zach Wilson. Most people believe the San Francisco 49ers are going to draft either Mac Jones or Trey Lance. My money is that they're my money is on them drafting Mac Jones. The Falcons, they could take a quarterback, but all reports point to them passing on a quarterback to stick with Matt Ryan for another for another year or two. And the Bengals, they're sold on Joe Burrow. So you can get a franchise quarterback in this draft at number six overall. And here's why I believe the Miami Dolphins should draft the quarterback. Okay, here's my biggest reasons why. First of all, this is a great quarterback draft, especially at the top, okay? And if Tua Tungavaloa were entering this draft, you can make the argument He'd be the sixth quarterback taken off the board. That's how talented this quarterback draft class is. And let's say, for example, someone like Justin Fields is there on the board for you. Okay, and you pass up on him. And then the New England Patriots get their hands on him. Or potentially Trey Lance. See, what you have to understand is sometimes maybe you need to draft a player so the other teams out there can't possibly get their hands on them. You know, the Dallas Cowboys, they drafted CeeDee Lamb because he's a very good player, but also because they knew the Philadelphia Eagles wanted him, okay? Sometimes that tactic, you know, you need to imply it every now and then, okay? But the quarterback position is very important, so the bottom line for me is Justin Fields is just a better overall prospect than Tua Tagovailoa. Same with, same with Trey Lance. Both, to me, are just as accurate of quarterbacks. Both can read the field very well. Both process information very quickly. Both don't throw interceptions. Both are much more dynamic athletes and are more mobile in the pocket than Tua Tagovailoa. And both have more explosive arms, okay? They're better overall prospects. They're more talented quarterbacks than Tua. And let's say the Miami Dolphins pass on, you know, someone like Justin Fields at number six overall, and then a team in their division trades up for them, the New England Patriots. What if the Patriots trade up for Justin Fields? Boy, oh boy, you better hope to a hit because I I have a strong belief that if Belichick drafts Justin Fields or Trey Lance, 
for, they're going to be one of the next great quarterbacks, okay? And for the next three years from now, and, and you can you can potentially look back three years from now, if two is not performing well and Justin Fields is lighting it up, I think Miami should regret that decision. And by the way, you also passed on Justin Herbert in last year's draft. And honestly, I was one of those people that didn't quite see this spectacular of a, of a performance coming from Justin Herbert. I will admit that. But you got to start owning up to your mistakes. And listen, Tua, you got to realize what he is. He's a game-managing quarterback with an average arm. He's just way too safe. He doesn't push the football down the field consistently. He's not a risk taker. He's naturally a safe quarterback with not a big-time arm, not a not very super mobile either, okay? And we saw sort of the game-managing quarterback in Jimmy Garoppolo with a loaded roster, not be able to win a Super Bowl. Jared Goff was on a loaded Los Angeles Rams team. He couldn't win a Super Bowl. And both Jimmy G and Jared Goff today are better quarterbacks than Tua Tagovailoa. They're proven. Tua hasn't proven much at all, other than he can win some games, you know, at the NFL level, if given a good supporting cast around him. But Mr. Trubisky won games with Chicago. Mr. Trubisky, for his career, has an above 500 record with Chicago. Tim Tebow, at one point, went on a nice little winning streak, okay? And people are going to say, well, last year, Tua was 6-3 and three as a starter. Tua Tungvaloa last year beat one playoff team. And in that, in that game in which he beat the playoff team, that team being the Rams, he threw for 93 yards and completed 54% of his throws. Folks, Tua is not a game-changing franchise quarterback. And in a division with Bill Belichick and the Patriots roster, you know, Brian Flo you know, not Brian Flores, Brian Flores is the coach, you know, Sean McDermott and the Buffalo Bills, and potentially the New York Jets being on the rise with a star quarterback, I believe the Miami Dolphins should move on from Tua Tagovailoa. It's that simple to me. Um, I'm not a huge believer in what Tua brings to the table, and I believe the Miami Dolphins should consider moving on from Tua for all the reasons that I mentioned. So, you know, last year the Green Bay Packers made a ton of headlines in the 2020 NFL Draft for pretty much all the wrong reasons. None of their draft picks were able to help them this year compete for a Super Bowl, that's that's problematic because you would think that in an offseason or in a draft, you get a couple of players to help you, you know, try to get over the hump. They did not have any single player in their draft class be able to help them this year. And a lot of their draft picks were for the future, particularly their first round pick from last year. That first round pick being Jordan Love. The Green Bay Packers obviously traded up to draft Jordan Love in the first round despite Aaron Rodgers playing very good football, despite Aaron Rodgers being one of the three best quarterbacks in all of football at the time, being the most talented thrower of the football the NFL has ever seen. And he just made he, he made a deep playoff run last year. Aaron Rodgers got the Packers to the NFC Championship game with the first-year head coach. They were one game away from the Super Bowl. you think the Green Bay Packers would go all in last year, but no, they opted for the future, okay? And instead of going all in to help out Aaron Rodgers, like I said, they chose to opt for the future. They drafted Jordan Love. They didn't need a quarterback. Jordan Love is not helping Aaron Rodgers win a Super Bowl right now. He's a pick for the future. They also drafted A.J. Dillon when they already had Aaron Jones and Jamal Williams. You were already really good at running back. The reason why they drafted A.J. Dillon was because they were afraid they potentially could lose Aaron Jones. Obviously, they resigned Aaron Jones, but... It's not like AJ Dillon was a big piece to them winning a Super Bowl, to them potentially winning a Super Bowl last year. Okay, they also drafted three offensive linemen. They were already they were already they were already really good offensive line. What Green Bay needed was a linebacker, was a wide receiver. They didn't draft a single wide receiver in a wide receiver loaded draft. They needed another you know linebacker potentially, another corner, you know, another defensive lineman, and that caused Green Bay in the end because. The team that they faced in the NFC Championship game, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, led by Tom Brady, they went all in for the Super Bowl this past offseason in free agency and through the draft. And the Green Bay Packers, they did virtually nothing in free agency. And for the draft, they pretty much mailed it in and said, we're preparing for the future. Now, what I will say is this. In the 2021 draft, and pretty much, not, pretty much for Green Bay's drafts going forward, what they do in the draft will tell you what the Green Bay Packers think of think of about Aaron Rodgers and his future. If the Green Bay Packers are confident Aaron Rodgers can help them 
continue to win Super Bowls going forward. They're going to go all in to help him this draft. Okay, They're going to potentially draft a cornerback, a defensive lineman, a wide receiver, or a linebacker. Heck, maybe they trade away Jordan Love and say, hey, you know, we whiffed. That was a mistake. But what the Green Bay Packers do in the draft going forward, it is going to tell us all we need to know about how the Green Bay Packers view Aaron Rodgers and his future as a potential Green Bay Packer. Aaron Rodgers, um, he's expressed multiple times that he wants to stay in Green Bay for his entire career, but Green Bay clearly doesn't care because they went up and drafted a quarterback to replace him potentially. And if Aaron Rodgers, you know, pretty much doesn't go out there and play at an MVP level year in and year out, they very well could replace him whether it's a good move or not. We could debate that, you know, 24-7, but the bottom line is, the Green Bay Packers draft will tell you all we need to know about Aaron Rodgers and his future in Green Bay. My gut is the, t the clock is ticking, but we shall see. I've always been a firm believer that Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers have been an odd fit. Aaron Rodgers is the star-studded quarterback, you know, this rock star, you know, He's, the, he's hosting Jeopardy. He's a celebrity. Meanwhile, the Green Bay Packers organization, they're in a small town in Wisconsin. Uh, not a whole lot of stars that are for agents want to come play there. You know, it's a small city. And I've always kind of felt that Aaron Rodgers, you know, he's more best suited playing for a bigger market. Not saying that he can't, you know, market himself in Green Bay because he still gets a ton of State Farm commercials. But that's not the point. The Green Bay Packers have wasted away Aaron Rodgers' greatness, okay? Because here's the thing, people. Aaron Rodgers has been the Green Bay Packers starter for 13 years. The Green Bay Packers have won one Super Bowl with Aaron Rodgers as their starting quarterback. And don't say Aaron Rodgers is a, is a choker in the playoffs. You know who's you know who second all-time in, in playoff touchdown passes to Tom Brady? It's Aaron Rodgers. The only other player in NFL history that has thrown more touchdown passes in the playoffs, then Aaron Rodgers is Tom Brady. Aaron Rodgers is not the problem. You know, it, it's not his problem that in the in his losses in the playoffs, the defense is giving up 36 points per game on average, okay? And to put another thing in context, the Green Bay Packers went from Brett Favre to Aaron Rodgers. They had Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers for 29 straight years. And they've only got two Super Bowl rings to show for it. But that's we're not going to talk about Brett Favre. We're going to focus in on Aaron Rodgers. So here's the thing. Have you guys noticed in this offseason that the Green Bay Packers, fresh off of losing in the NFC Championship game to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, they've done absolutely nothing in free agency or via trade to improve this Packers team? The Green Bay Packers, based on their philosophy and based on the way they're doing business, what they're telling me is they're good with being just good enough. They're going to field a competitive team. They're not going to be like the old Cleveland Browns where there's absolutely no talent on the roster. They're going to have good quarterback play with Ian Rodgers. But Green Bay doesn't understand what it takes to get to that next level and to be a Super Bowl caliber organization because, quite frankly, they've won a Super Bowl in over a decade, and they've had the greatest thrower of the football named Aaron Rodgers playing at an extremely high level. Aaron Rodgers, during that stretch, has won three league MVPs, okay? He's not the problem, okay? Green Bay doesn't care about being the favorites or being great. They don't understand what it takes to win multiple Super Bowls. They're not a team that takes big swings in free agency. They don't spend money in free agency. They don't make trades. They're all about, oh, they're covered in draft picks. We're going to try to see if the 25th overall pick in the draft develops into something special. We're going to see if our six-round middle linebacker that we stole out of Iowa, we're going to see if that guy develops. Green Bay is all about draft picks and wanting guys to develop. And I understand you want to home grow your players, but at some point, you have to realize that that philosophy is just not working. You haven't been back to a Super Bowl in over a decade. And I don't want to hear about the salary cap. I am so sick and tired of that sorry, pathetic excuse from Packers fans, from you know people in the organization. The New York Giants have virtually zero cap space this offseason. But you know what they did? They were flexible with their cap space. They figured it out, and they re-signed Leonard Williams. They signed the best wide receiver on the market named Kenny Galladay, and they signed a Dory Jackson to a big-time deal. The Los Angeles Rams have been 
in cap hell for the past couple of years. Their cap situation has been horrible. They still found a way to trade for Matthew Stafford, and they paid Jared Goff a ton of money. The Pittsburgh Steelers paid Ben Rosberger a couple of years ago. They still found, find ways to make moves around Big Ben. The New Orleans Saints were $100 million over the cap this offseason. But they got it down to zero because they were flexible and they figured out a way to work around the salary cap. And by the way, if any team last year was going to draft a quarterback, it should have been the Saints because Drew Brees, he was in his 40s. Aaron Rodgers, he was in his late 30s, still a, a lot of great years left. But the Saints said, no, we're not going to draft Jordan Lowe. We're all in on trying to win a Super Bowl with Drew Brees. Obviously, Drew Brees didn't get it done, but that was the right move. They went all in and spent every asset they could to give Drew Brees every opportunity to win a second Super Bowl, okay? And you hear every offseason, oh, the Green Bay Packers, they're in the market for J.J. Watt. They don't get J.J. Watt. Oh, the Green Bay Packers, they're in the market for Cleo Mack. They don't get Cleo Mack. Cleo Mack goes to their division ride right with the Chicago Bears. Oh, Patrick Peterson's on the market this offseason. They don't get Patrick Peterson, despite him going for only $10 million a year. Oh, Kyle Fuller, he's out there. He signed a cheap deal this offseason, but the Packers didn't sign him. How come every year the big time for agents just aren't coming to Green Bay? Green Bay hasn't even made a slightest of trade or a slightest of moves since making a couple of splashy moves in 2018. And I'm sorry, Brian Gutekus or Ted Thompson, whoever's in that front office. Okay, listen, that's not good enough. You need to constantly be trying to improve the team. See, what the Green Bay Packers did this year is they tried to backdoor their way to a Super Bowl championship. Because they said, oh, we think our team's good enough. We're going to allow these players to develop. And we don't need to spend money in free agency because Aaron Rodgers and our coaching staff, they're going to elevate the players within this roster. And guess what? Aaron Rodgers and the Pack and the Packers coaching staff were able to develop Marquez Valdez Scanley and Alan Lazar. They fielded a great team. Imagine what would have happened if they actually added a Justin Jefferson or a Chase Claypool or a Patrick Queen because – in the NFC Championship game versus the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, it was clear the Green Bay Packers were short of about three to four impactful players before we could consider them beating the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Tampa Bay was far and away the better team. I saw them face Green Bay twice last year, and Green Bay didn't match up with their physicality. They're just not better than Tampa Bay. They're not better than Kansas City. They're not better than Buffalo. They're not better than some of these teams out there, okay? They're just not from a talent perspective. The only reason why they're relevant is because Aaron Rodgers is their quarterback. And by the way, Green Bay, you got lucky with getting Brett Favre to Aaron Rodgers, okay? It's not going to happen again. So I suggest you change your ways. And when it comes to Green Bay, they don't match up with the elite front offices right now because right now, Tampa Bay is making moves. Kansas City is making moves. The Rams are making moves. Even the Cleveland stinking Browns have become a more aggressive and more surefire team as far as making moves in free agency making moves via trade, then the Green Bay Packers, the Cleveland Browns, even they get it, and they're in the Midwest. I don't want to hear about the Midwest mentality. Green Bay has always been about, oh, can Aaron Rodgers save us in the playoffs? They've always been way too Aaron Rodgers dependent. The minute Aaron Rodgers throws an interception, the minute he plays a bad game, the minute Aaron Rodgers isn't perfect in the playoffs, they lose. See, what allowed Ben Rosberger to win multiple Super Bowls, what allowed Terry Bradshaw to win multiple Super Bowls, what allowed Troy Aikman to win multiple Super Bowls, what allowed you know, Tom Brady, Brady to win multiple Super Bowls, is their roster could fight back even when their quarterback wasn't playing great football. Tom Brady, he won a Super Bowl 13-3. to How many defensive shootouts have the Patriots won in spite of Tom Brady? Okay, in the past, you know, and, and this past year, Tampa Bay had an elite roster, one of the most talented rosters of all time. Green Bay has had one elite defense in Aaron Rodgers' career. He's only had a top 10 def he's only had a top five defense, top five defense. He's only had a top five defense one time in his career. And that one time, they won the Super Bowl. And that year, you know, you know who's on, who, you know who was on the roster? Charles, Charles Woodson. They actually made a free agent signing. So, the bottom line is the Green Bay Packers, they're wasting away Aaron Rodgers' greatness. It really irks me. It really ticks me off due to the fact that Aaron Rodgers has to suffer from an organization that, you know, doesn't have an owner, that doesn't spend big 
time, money, and free agency, and an organization that, quite frankly, is just good with being just good enough to get by and and see if they luck into winning a Super Bowl. That's what Green Bay is all about, and it's very sad because Aaron Rodgers, as an all-time great talent, he deserves better. So, like I said, the Green Bay Packers, to me at least, they've developed into not being a Super Bowl caliber organization. Now, I will admit, Green Bay finds a way to get the quarterback position right, okay? They find a way to get that thing right. Teams like Washington, teams like, I don't know, the Jets, the Jaguars, for years and years, they can't fi- they can't seem to find the right quarterback, and that that's a big reason why they're an irrelevant franchise. So one thing we know about Green Bay is they can find a quarterback, okay? We know that, okay? So I'll give them that credit. They're not a dysfunctional organization. However, they're not one of the top dogs. They're not Baltimore. They're not Pittsburgh. They're not Kansas City. They're not in the category of front offices that know how to get things done and will get things done no matter what the cost is, no matter what the salary cap is, et cetera, et cetera. The reason why the Green Bay Packers are not a Super Bowl caliber organization is because they are just not aggressive enough. They don't spend money. They don't make trades, okay? And they don't understand what it takes to go all in to be great, like I said. They're okay with just being good enough. And like I said earlier, I don't want to hear the salary cap excuses. The Giants have no problem making moves. The Rams have no problem making moves. The Saints have no problem making moves. The Steelers have no problem making moves. It seems like every team on the planet, except the Green Bay Packers, find a way to create cap space, okay? That's a, that's a poor excuse. And here's all you need to know about the Green Bay Packers. The Green Bay Packers have had Aaron Rodgers and Brett Favre, as, as one or the other, as their starting quarterback, for 29 straight seasons. They've won two Super Bowls as a result of that. That's pathetic. That's not good enough. That's the bare minimum. You should win one Super Bowl with Brett Favre. You should win one Super Bowl with Aaron Rodgers. I know for a fact you should have been, you should win at least three to four potential Super Bowls with Aaron Rodgers. I'll, I'll say at least multiple. Okay. Maybe I went too far with three or four. You should have at least been back to a Super Bowl with Aaron Rodgers. And like I said, the Green Bay Packers, they're just okay with, you know, going out each year, trying to compete and seeing what happens in the playoffs instead of actually being the favorites. Green Bay understands what it takes to field a competitive team, but they don't understand what it takes to get to the next level. They just don't. They're always, you know, saying, ooh, let's hope this coach fi- figures it out finally. Let's see if Mike Pettin figures it out. And then, and then it's too late, and then they fired Mike Pettin when he should have been fired a year ago. Okay, same with Mike McCarthy. Mike McCarthy stayed his welcome in Green Bay way too long. He was a problem in Green Bay. They're always like, oh, let's see if this inside linebacker that we drafted in the fourth round pans out. And the crazy thing is, you would think Green Bay would look back on history and say, hmm, when we've actually spent money for agency, we've won Super Bowls. When the Green Bay Packers signed Reggie White, they won a Super Bowl. When they signed Charles Winston, they won a Super Bowl. And I'm over this whole, oh, the Green Bay Packers, they're going to have a good draft. They've been drafted players for years and years. And to be quite honest with you, their current general manager, Brian Gutekus, outside of Jair Alexander and outside of um, Elton Jenkins and outside of, I think that there's one more other player that's super duper impactful. But the Green Bay Packers have had virtually three Pro Bowl impactful level players drafted in the last three drafts. Everything else has been a bunch of average and busts, okay? A bunch of just players that aren't good enough, that aren't going to make the team. And you can say, oh, the Packers are giving Aaron Rodgers, Marcos Valdez Scaling, and Alan Lazard and these guys. Those guys would not be starting on the Kansas City Chiefs roster. They would not be starting for the Buffalo Bills roster. They would not be starting for the Los Angeles Rams roster, on the Los Angeles Rams roster, okay? So, oh, Darnell Savage was that guy. Yeah, so Brian Gutekus in three drafts has drafted Jair Alexander, Darnell Savage, and Elton Jenkins. That's three good players. That's that, that's really good, but where's the other players? Where are the other ones? I don't see them. So the bottom line is, until Green Bay shows me that they're going to be aggressive and actually go all in to help out Aaron Rodgers in this roster, that is very, very close to winning a Super Bowl, by the way, 
I cannot consider them a Super Bowl caliber organization. We could talk about the talent being very good on the team. We could talk about Aaron Rodgers and Matt LaFleur being a head coach and quarterback combination that is going to win football games. And Green Bay, they might luck their way into a Super Bowl like they did in 2010. You know, they, they got some breaks in the playoffs. They found a way to win a Super Bowl. But Green Bay is never going to be in the conversation for being able to win multiple Super Bowls because they just don't make the necessary moves to put themselves in that position. So the Green Bay Packers, they're not a Super Bowl caliber organization, and you can refute all the points you want. All, all you need to know is Green Bay, they've had Aaron Rodgers and Brett Favre for 29 straight years, and they've only got two Super Bowl rings to show for it. That's not good enough in my opinion. You know, there's this there's this myth out there, at least in my opinion, that Aaron Rodgers is a bad leader. And look, I don't know Aaron Rodgers personally. I've never met the guy. I'd love to meet the guy in person one day. Hopefully I can go to a Packers game, maybe get VIP seats. I don't know if Green Bay allows you to have access to the players and, you know, get pictures, get autographs. But if they do, you know, I'll definitely be jumping on that offer this offseason because this very well could be Aaron Rodgers last year in Green Bay, but that's not the point. You know, I don't know Aaron Rodgers personally, never met the guy, but I don't understand why everyone paints Aaron Rodgers as this bad guy and as this terrible leader, okay? First of all, if you're a Super Bowl champion or an NBA champion or a champion of any sort, you're not a bad leader to me. You're just not, okay? If you won a championship or led a team to a championship on any level, I don't think you can ever be considered a bad leader. You know, everyone. I always roll my eyes when people say, oh, Kobe Bryant wasn't a great leader. Kobe Bryant won five NBA championships, people. He led, he led the Lakers to two of those championships where he was the main guy. Obviously, Shaq helped him out with his first three, but Kobe Bryant was not a bad leader. You know, people say, oh, Michael Jordan, his leadership qualities weren't very good. No, Michael Jordan won six, won six NBA Finals MVPs, okay? Now, were those guys always liked? No, they weren't always liked because they were tough on teammates. But do you want to know why they were tough on teammates? And you want to know why teammates didn't like them? Because they were trying to get the best out of those guys. And deep down, those teammates should be thankful that Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant were a pain in the you-know-what because they were all they were trying to do was get the best out of those guys. Have you seen Nick Saban on the sideline? It looks like at times when his players make mistakes that he's going to try to rip their head off. But Nick Saban knows that if he coaches his players extremely hard that he'll get the most out of them, okay? Is Ian Rodgers as likable? As a Tom Brady or Joe Montana? No, probably not. But the thing about Aaron Rodgers is he expects greatness out of his teammates. And he's going to do whatever it takes to try to get the greatness out of his teammates. And if he needs to be a guy that's not liked among that locker room, hey, that's how he's going to take that high road. That's how it's going to be. And the thing about Aaron Rodgers is we never have heard anything about Aaron Rodgers not being a competitive guy. In fact, everyone that's spoken about Aaron Rodgers have said that he's one of the most competitive teammates they've ever had, okay? They've never questioned his work ethic, and Aaron Rodgers leads by example. And what Aaron Rodgers is doing is he's being the best version of himself. And why are you guys asking Aaron Rodgers to be this rah-rah guy and something that he's not? If you're trying to be something that you're not, you're not being authentic to the people that you're working with, okay? Don't try to be something you're not. Be the best version of yourself. The best leaders know when to speak up, and they know when to take a step back. And Aaron Rodgers, I believe he's that guy. And in the past, people have talked about Jermichael Finley has called out Aaron Rodgers. Greg Jennings has called out Aaron Rodgers. So what? Just because... You know, three or four individuals have called out Aaron Rodgers publicly. That doesn't paint him out to be a bad leader. Apple, they've had a ton of bad reviews come their way. But they're defined by the millions and millions 
of great reviews. I'm sure McDonald's gets commercial gets um customers that complain about their food every single day. No one's perfect, but McDonald's is not defined by those three people that are angry that their cheeseburger might be stale. They're defined by the millions of other people that rock with their cheeseburger, that rock with their French fries. Okay, same with Burger King, same with Chick Fil A. You know, you're not defined by a bad review or one person saying you're a bad person, okay? I'm sure there are teammates out there that don't think that highly of Tom Brady. That doesn't mean that the other, you know, 90% of the teammates that Tom Brady's had doesn't love the guy to death, okay? And at times, Aaron Rodgers will call out his teammates in a press conference, not necessarily his teammates, but his team and say, you know, yeah, we were flat today. Yeah, we didn't come out with energy. Guys, He's being honest, okay? And maybe that helps out. Maybe that helps fire up his team. Aaron Rodgers is in that locker room. We're not. He knows what makes his team tick. He knows what makes them, you know, go. Maybe he sees that as him motivating those guys. And quite frankly, if you're being honest at the podium about your team's performance, like, hey, you know, we, we practiced well this week. We came out flat and we didn't play well. He's telling the truth, people. So. Don't knock Aaron Rodgers for being something that he is not, okay? Or trying to be something that he's not, okay? Aaron Rodgers is authentic. You know what you're going to get. And I believe he's actually underrated as a leader. And by the way, Aaron Rodgers, he's a Super Bowl champion. We talk about Aaron Rodgers like he's never won a championship, okay? That's the way the media talks about Aaron Rodgers. They talk about Aaron Rodgers like he's never won three MVPs. Like, he's never won a Super Bowl. Dan Marino, as great as he was, never won a Super Bowl. Phillip Rivers, never won a Super Bowl. Everyone talks about Phillip Rivers' great leadership. Well, how come Phillip Rivers couldn't win a Super Bowl? Is it because Phillip Rivers is a bad leader? No. It's because winning Super Bowls are hard, people. So the bottom line is, I've never understood why the media tries to, put, to paint Aaron Rodgers to be this bad guy. A lot of teammates have actually came out and defended Aaron Rodgers, and I don't understand why people consider Aaron Rodgers a bad leader. Aaron Rodgers, at least from my account, to me, should not be considered a bad leader. And I want to move on to the New York Jets. This is my final warning for the New York Jets. The New York Jets should not draft Zach Wilson. I think Zach Wilson is an overrated prospect. He's one of those guys that, the hype has just been insane, okay? It really has. And I really don't understand why the hype has been so insane this year. Look, Zach Wilson had an unbelievable final year at BYU. He has good traits. You see the off-platform throws. You see the accuracy at times. You at times see the mobility. You see some good things on tape. But in this quarterback draft class, he should not be being drafted over guys like Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields, or Trey Lance. He's not one of the three most talented quarterbacks in this draft class. When I compare Zach Wilson to this amazing quarterback class, you know, when, when you compare him to Trevor Lawrence, he's not as big as Trevor Lawrence, doesn't have quite as strong of an arm as Trevor Lawrence. Trevor Lawrence has been, you know, dominating college football, football for the past three years. Zach Wilson, a little bit of a one-year wonder. When it comes to him, him being compared to Justin Fields, he isn't the dynamic athlete that Justin Fields is. You know, Zach Wilson doesn't have a signature win under his resume. In fact, Zach Wilson is 0-5 versus teams with 10 wins or more in his BYU career. And in those five games, he's thrown one touchdown pass to seven interceptions. Trey Lance, you know, I believe Trey Lance to have a better arm than Zach Wilson. He's more athletic. He plays better within structure, more so than Zach Wilson. And I can make the argument that Mac Jones is a more precise thrower of the football and a more consistent decision maker than even Zach Wilson. And like I said, I'm not trying to knock Zach Wilson too much. I just think that in a very stacked quarterback class, he's being overrated, okay? And the New York Jets, they shouldn't draft the guy. He's not a significant upgrade over Sam Darnold, okay? He's just not. He's not that guy, okay? Justin Fields, needs to be the pick at number two overall, assuming that Trevor Lawrence goes number one to the Jaguars. If it's not Justin Fields, maybe you draft Trey Lance. You could say, oh, well, Jamon, there's no one on the Jets roster to save Trey Lance or help develop him. That's why you can go out there 
and trade for Gardner Minch. You can find a veteran quarterback out there somewhere that could be the scapegoat and the guy that takes the pounding for Trey Lance while he develops, okay? And I'm sorry, but in a division with Brian Flores, Sean McDermott, Bill Belichick, I don't know if Zach Wilson is ready for that smoke. I'm just not. And my biggest knock on Zach Wilson is he ad libs way too much. I think his arm strength and mobility both are overrated. Like he's a, he has a good firm arm, but not, you know, this cannon that people say he has, you know. And he's not as fast as people think he is. In fact, in tight little pockets, when the pocket gets tight, Zach Wilson did not show the ability to escape pressure, in my opinion. He just was not very good under pressure in college. He beat no good teams. When he was faced with blitzes, he struggled. He ad-libbed way too much. And quite frankly, he was just bad. And look, I got nothing against Zach Wilson. I believe he's a nice, fine little prospect. But there's levels to this. And you're telling me if you're going to move on from Sam Darnold, who to me still had potential to become a good quarterback one day. And by the way, that's, that's me saying a lot because I was not – a huge Sam Darnold fan at USC, but you mean to tell me any quarterback in Sam Darnold's situation was going to succeed? See, here's the thing. The New York Jets, they are under the most pressure out of any team in the NFL draft because not only does Zach Wilson need to be better than what Sam Darnold was in New York, and by the way, I think he can achieve that because he's going to be put in a much more stable situation than Sam Darnold, but he needs to outperform what Sam Darnold was I'm sorry, not was, he needs to outperform what Sam Darnold is going to become in Carolina. And with really good weapons, a really good running back, and a really good coaching staff, I have a good feeling that Sam Darnold has a chance to prove a lot of people wrong in Carolina. And not only does Zach Wilson need to be better than what Sam Darnold becomes in Carolina, he has to be better than Justin Fields. He has to be better than Trey Lance. He has to be better than Mac Jones. If you're picking him with the number two overall pick a year after you moved on from Sam Darnold, oh, he better light the world on fire. He cannot be a bust. Because if Sam Darnold is lighting it up with the Carolina Panthers, and you see Justin Fields lighting it up with the Patriots, a team in your division that potentially could grab him if he drops, Oh, man, you're going to have to answer a ton, and I mean a ton of questions. So, again, I just don't see it with Zach Wilson. I think he's a good prospect, but not a great prospect and not worthy of the second overall pick. So, the last final warning for the New York Jets, please do not draft Zach Wilson. He's not capable of taking over that franchise and being the guy in the Big Apple to live up to the hype. He's just not that guy. He's been overhyped from the jump. He's a good prospect, but guys like Justin Fields or or Trey Lance, they're better, and that's where I stand on Zach Wilson and him potentially going to the New York Jets. I now want to shift to Sam Darnold, another quarterback that was a New York Jet this past season, but now he's taking his talents to the Carolina Panthers. Sam Darnold, during his three-year career with the Jets, really had no structure around him, really had no chance to succeed. Was de- He had a lot of bad coaching around him, not great weapons, no real run game, terrible offensive line. But the bottom line was you didn't see the flashes that you hoped you would see from Sam Darnold. So as a result, the New York Jets, they moved on. And by the way, if Sam Darnold struggled this upcoming season, the, the Jets organs, Jets fans were going to probably riot because you had an opportunity to draft Zach Wilson. You had an opportunity to draft Justin Fields. So I understand why the Jets moved on. So the Jets traded Sam Darn away for three draft picks, a sixth round pick in the 2021 NFL draft and a second rounder and a fourth rounder in 2022. And look, I was not a huge Sam Darnold fan back at USC. People were saying he was a generational talent. I felt that he, I felt that his playing style was way too reckless. He had a, he had a lot of bad fumbles, a lot of bad interceptions. I felt he lacked really good pocket awareness inside the pocket, and he had hit and miss accuracy. But I did see the potential. I understood why people fell in love with him. Okay, and look, it's not a guarantee that Sam Darnold turns his career around with the Carolina Panthers because. There are issues with his accuracy. There are issues with the turnovers. He still, to me, is learning how to play the position. Okay, and that's fine because even Tom Brady is still trying to get better every single day. But Sam Darnold's way behind the eight ball as far as his development goes, okay? 
But I will say, Sam Darnold is being put in a much better position in Carolina than he was compared to the situation with the New York Jets, okay? What was the reason Sam Darnold didn't have a lot of support in New York? For me, it was a big reason why it was because of the coaching, okay? He goes from Adam Gase to Matt Rule and Joe Brady. Joe Brady, we saw what he did at LSU with Joe Burrow. Joe Burrow, you know, a year, uh, the year before Joe Brady got there, no, no one was talking about Joe Burrow. But Joe Burrow improves. He gets with an offensive play car that fit, that knows how to run an NFL offense that will fit his skill set. Joe Burrow becomes the number one overall pick in the draft. Joe Brady is already getting phone calls to be a head coach, and he's been a coordinator not even for a long time in the NFL. And Matt Rule, I've loved him ever since his Baylor days. He, he improved this Carolina Panthers team last year. They were a competitive team under his coaching. So he's got a good coaching in Carolina. He didn't have great wide receivers in New York. Well, guess what? Now he gets DJ Moore and Robbie Anderson to throw to. That's a really good wide receiver duo. DJ Moore, I think he's a capable number one wide receiver. And I believe Robbie Anderson is a capable number one wide receiver. And by the way, Sam Darnold actually had really good chemistry at times with Robbie Anderson back with the Jets. They never retained Robbie Anderson. That's a big reason why I think Sam Darnold regressed. Also, to have Christian McCaffrey tan the football off to and throw the football two out of the backfield. Christian McCaffrey is a really good running back, one of the top five running backs in all of football. Plus, the Carolina Panthers have multiple draft picks to really help improve this roster, and they have a good young defense. So here's what I'm going to say. If Sam Darnold can't succeed in Carolina, he's not a franchise quarterback, point blank, period, because you got star wide receivers, you got a star running back, you got a young progressive head coach and a young progressive play caller, you got a defense on the rise, and you're in you're in a division now where Drew Brees is no longer there, the Falcons are a mess, and while the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are loaded, we don't know how long Tom Brady is going to play. This is a great situation for Sam Darnold to turn around his career. And by the way, I'm going to give myself some credit like three months ago, I put out this scenario that Sam Darnold should want to go to Carolina. Now he's gotten potentially his wish, a fresh start with good weapons, a good running back, better coaching staff, better players around him, a winnable division. Now it's on Sam Darnold to prove to the world why he was the number three overall pick out of USC. This is all on Sam Darnold. Okay, if he fails with the Carolina Panthers, he's just flat out not a franchise quarterback. And I think Sam Darnold has an opportunity to become a franchise quarterback in Carolina. Now, will he ever become a great franchise quarterback? I doubt that, but I can see Sam Darnold, you know, developing one day into being one of the 15 best quarterbacks in all football. I can see that. And I think he can win a Super Bowl potentially with a top 15 quarterback if that guy is able to elevate under pressure in the playoffs. That's a whole story for another day. The bottom line is, Carolina's going to take a risk on Sam Darnold. I believe in the risk, and we'll see what happens. Will Sam Darnold turn his career around with the Carolina Panthers based on the roster that he's going to be given and based on the coaching staff he's going to be given? I say he has a good chance, but only time will tell because he has a lot of questions to answer. Okay, so recently, the temp, not the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, pardon me. Let me start over. So recently, the Denver Broncos traded for Teddy Bridgewater, the former New Orleans Saints quarterback, the former Minnesota Vikings quarterback, and from this past season, he played for the Carolina Panthers. They traded, they've traded for Teddy Bridgewater. Um, they gave him a six-round pick, and if Teddy Bridgewater turns into a functional starting quarterback with the Broncos. That's a pretty good deal considering that they gave up a six-round pick. However, I will say, if Denver was going to trade for a potential quarterback, they should have traded for Gardner Minshew. Gardner Minshew is a franchise quarterback. He's, he's very accurate. He's played really good football despite being put in a horrible situation in Jacksonville. Right now today, Gardner Minshew might be the most underrated quarterback in all football. So, if I were the Broncos, I would have seriously considered going after Garner Minshew. But hey, they went after Teddy Bridgewater. He's one of the few quarterbacks left on the market. I understand why they did it, okay? Now, 
What does this mean for the Denver Broncos? What does this mean for Drew Locke? This tells me the Denver Broncos are not completely sold on Drew Locke because when you look at some of the other young quarterbacks in football right now, Daniel Jones with the New York Giants. The Giants haven't brought any quarterback in to compete with Daniel Jones. They've they've allowed him to be the guy, okay, going forward. Sam Darnold, the, Car- the Carolina Panthers just traded for him. They let Teddy Bridgewater go. There's not going to be a quarterback competition unless Carolina drafts a quarterback, and I doubt they will, at least in the first round. And Kyler Murray, we know he's special. No one's challenging him, okay? So the Denver Broncos, if they were sold on Drew Locke, they wouldn't have made this move. They're going to make this a real quarterback competition. And I don't know who's going to win this competition, but I think that Teddy Bridgewater has the slight advantage over Drew Locke because here's the thing. The current head coach for the Denver Broncos is Vic Vangio. And what is Vic Vangio known for? He's known for his defense. And defensive-minded head coaches, you know what they hate? They hate quarterbacks that make mistakes. Okay, Nick Saban, Ron Rivera, those guys, they don't like quarterbacks that make mistakes. And Drew Locke, the book is out on him. He's not very accurate. He stares down wide receivers. He'll throw bad interceptions. He'll make bad decisions. And he makes way too many mistakes, okay? And you and a big reason why the Denver Broncos underperformed last year was because Drew Locke was not a very good starting quarterback, okay? Now, another thing that we need to point out is that's with a good roster around Drew Locke. Does Denver have one of the 10 best rosters in all football? I say no, but they still have a talented football team. They've got good wide receivers. They've got a solid offensive the line. They've got a solid defense. Pat Shermer, to me, is one of the best play callers in all football as far as as far as being offensive coordinator. Drew Locke was holding this team back. And I will say, the thing that Teddy Bridgewater does is he's going to be a reliable option. You know what you're going to get week to week with Teddy Bridgewater. Week to week, you don't know what you're going to get with Drew Locke. And maybe Drew Locke takes a huge leap this offseason. I'm rooting for Drew Locke. I was a huge fan of what Drew Locke brought to the table at Missouri. I felt he was worthy of a top 10 pick when he was coming out of Missouri. I felt he was going to be the future of the Broncos. So I'm rooting for Drew Locke. And there are reports that he's been working with Peyton Manning this offseason watching film. That's awesome. But Drew Locke has to go out there and prove this year once and for all he is that guy. Not only does he have to win the starting job, he has to go out there and play well and keep that starting job. Because the if he goes on a on a on a slump or for about three or four straight games, Vic Vangio is not going to tolerate that. Vic Vangio is potentially on the hot seat. So in order to save his job, he's not going to put his faith in Drew Locke. He's going to put his faith in Teddy Bridgewater, a veteran quarterback that doesn't make mistakes. Okay, now. Whether Teddy Bridgewater or Drew Locke is the starter for this Broncos team, I don't think they're a playoff team this year. You look at Kansas City, you look at the Chargers, you look at the Raiders, it's a very competitive division. I would say right now the Chargers are a very underrated team. I could see the Chiefs and Chargers making the playoffs this year, especially if Justin Herbert continues to get better and better. Not to mention you still got Cleveland, you still got Buffalo, Baltimore, Indianapolis, the Patriots. There's a lot of good teams in the AFC. I think Denver falls just short of being a playoff team. But this year needs to be about figuring out who's the quarterback of the future for the Broncos. Is it Teddy Bridgewater? Is it Drew Locke? Or is it a potential future draft pick? That's what Denver is going to have to figure out this year. And I will say, if they get good quarterback play, they could be a playoff team year in and year out because this roster is pretty talented. But But that's how I feel about Teddy Bridgewater going to the Broncos. Those are my thoughts right there. So. I now want to talk about Taylor Heineke. So I've been covering the Washington football team, you know, a good amount of times, you know, this offseason and last offseason. I was very high on Washington last year. I actually had them going 7-9, and nine, and they actually went 7-9 and nine this past year and actually made the playoffs in a very weak division. So I was pretty spot on about Washington outside of the fact that I felt Dwayne Haskins was the future for them at quarterback. But I want to talk about Taylor Heineke because – This is a guy that last year came out of nowhere for Washington, okay? If you don't know who Taylor Heineke is, he's a quarterback, and he's 28 years old, and he's bounced around the NFL over the years, 
From 2015 to 2016, he was he was with the Vikings. In 2017, he was with the Patriots. 2018, he was he was with the Carolina Panthers. In 2020, he found he found himself in the XFL playing for the St. Louis Battlehawks. And that very same year, he ends back up on he ends back up on Washington's roster. Okay, and because of injuries to Alex Smith and because of Dwayne Haskins being released, he was asked to start in a playoff game. Versus the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are the reigning defending Super Bowl champions. They won Super Bowl 55 in dominant fashion. And if you watch that game in the in the wild card round versus Washington, Taylor Heineke, well, the Buccaneers when they faced Washington, to be very clear. If you watched the Buccaneers face off versus the Washington football team, and you saw Taylor Heineke play in that game, I don't know how you can't come away impressed by his performance. He made incredible throws. He played really, really well. He was running around, making plays. He was accurate down the field. He made great decisions. He looked like a franchise quarterback versus an elite defense in the playoffs, and he barely has started any games in the NFL. And the biggest question I have is how come a former first-round pick in Dwayne Haskins could not pick up the playbook and couldn't show a ton of flashes, and Taylor Heineke comes in, barely has had a cup of coffee with his team, and barely knows the playbook, and he goes out there and makes plays. I have absolutely no idea how that works. Now, I will say, is Taylor Heineke the future of Washington at quarterback? Is he their future franchise quarterback? I have no idea, because we've seen sort of these Cinderella stories in the playoffs before, you know, Tim Tebow once beat Ben Roethlisberger in the playoffs. And Tim Tebow, he's not close to being a franchise quarterback, nor was he at the time. And I will say, Washington does have Ryan Fitzpatrick on the roster, and they could look to draft a quarterback. I would prefer that they go after Mac Jones, assuming the 49ers don't draft him, because I do believe Mac Jones is the perfect fit for Washington. Not that they can't draft Justin Fields or Trey Lance, but... I just think Washington needs a safe option at quarterback that's reliable, that's accurate, that's ready to win right now. Because this roster is ready to win right now, okay? So, Washington could look to drive a quarterback, but I believe Taylor Heineke is going to get a shot to prove himself in training camp and in the preseason. And if Taylor Heineke can really build off what he did versus the Buccaneers in the playoffs, I believe Washington has a decent franchise quarterback on, on their hands. So we'll see what happens with Taylor Heineke. I'm interested to see what his future holds in Washington. Is he the future franchise quarterback? I have no idea, but only time will tell. So let me shift to Mac Jones. You know, I watched every single throw that Mac Jones made this past year because I'm a quarterback nerd. I like to see, you know, what quarterbacks are bringing, bringing into the table um, come the NFL draft, you know, and I was impressed. He made a lot of good throws. He was consistently very accurate down the field. You know, there was his ball placement was very, very good. Rarely did I see balls behind his wide receivers thrown high, thrown too low. Mac Jones, more times than not, if a target is open, he's going to hit that target nine times out of ten. Okay, and we saw Mac Jones lead Alabama to a national championship. And in that national championship game, he actually outplayed Justin Fields. That doesn't mean Justin Fields isn't a better prospect than Mac Jones, but that should be taken into account when you're evaluating Mac Jones as a potential future franchise quarterback. And if it were not for so many good quarterbacks being in this draft class, like Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields, Trey Lance, even Zach Wilson, I think you can make the argument that Mac Jones would have been in the conversation for being the number one overall pick, okay? Now, we can debate whether or not that would be true, but if there weren't so many quarterbacks this year that are so good, Mac Jones would be getting a whole lot more buzz. I guarantee you that. Now, what are some teams that could potentially look to drive Mac Jones, okay? The 49ers are on his radar. The Falcons, maybe, you know, maybe we'll see. Denver, maybe we'll see. The Patriots, they've been linked to Mac Jones. But the one team I believe that makes a ton of sense for Mac Jones from a value perspective and based on where their team is right now and based on what Mac Jones brings to the table is Washington, okay? Washington right now 
has an elite defense led by Chase Young, who's, who's going to be a special player for a long time. They have a really good wide receiver core led by Terry McLaurin, a top 10 wide receiver. They've got a solid tight end in Logan Thomas, a star running back in Antonio Gibson, and Ron Rivera is their head coach. And according to Pro Football Focus, heading into 2021, they have Washington ranked as the eighth best roster in all football. All Washington needs is a solid quarterback that's accurate, that makes good decisions, and that is ready to win right now. They don't need a flashy guy or anything like that. They need a proven commodity because we've seen them go with the with the guy that has a lot of potential in RG3 so many times, and it hasn't panned out. And that's not to say that, that they shouldn't have done that in the past, but I think you need to learn from your past mistakes. And we all know Ron Rivera is a really good head coach, but Ron Rivera is not known for developing quarterbacks. He couldn't develop Dwayne Haskins. You know, he, he hasn't developed any quarterback of note, okay? And we all know Cam Newton won games in Carolina, but Cam Newton was a generational talent. Ron Rivera didn't have to develop, develop that guy. He was, a, he was a physical specimen that was really, really good from day number one in the NFL. Cam Newton was a top 10 quarterback, you know, for a good while in Carolina. Generational talent. Former league MVP that wanted, that went to a Super Bowl a couple of years ago. So I believe this team is actually very similar to the team Mac Jones won a national championship with at Alabama. They had really good wide receivers. They had an elite defense. They had solid tight ends, really good running backs, and a defensive minded head coach in Nick Saban. So for Mac Jones, this should be an easy transition. Washington cannot pass on Mac Jones if he is there. Assuming guys like Trey Lance or Justin Fields are off the board, if Mac Jones is there or available to potentially trade up for, you take him, Washington, and you run with him because, quite frankly, Ryan Fitzpatrick, he's not your guy. I'm going to bet that Taylor Heineke is not your guy. And this roster is really good. So you may never be in another position to get a franchise quarterback if you keep winning games. So I think that Mac Jones makes a ton of sense for the Washington football team. He'd be a great fit. And if I'm Washington, I would not pass up on Mac Jones. It makes way too much sense. Let me shift to the Chicago Bears. The Bears obviously moved on from Mitchell Trubisky this past year. He had a four-year career in Chicago. He was the former number two overall pick in the 2017 NFL Draft, the same draft that included quarterbacks like Deshaun Watson and Patrick Mahomes, two of the top five quarterbacks in all football. And Mitchell Trubisky, he just never lived up to the hype. He never did. And quite frankly, I don't think he was ever going to, you know. And here's the thing. When Chicago traded up one spot to get Mitchell Trubisky, and they passed on Deshaun Watson and Patrick Mahomes. At the time, I was not a fan of it. I felt that Patrick Mahomes and Deshaun Watson were much more dynamic quarterbacks. They were more talented, had more college starts, which seems to matter. It seems like if you're a one-year wonder or you have limited college starts, you know it's hard for you to get to, to get to the speed to get up to speed in the NFL. Um, Trubisky was a one-year wonder to me with sort of an average arm and. While Trubisky did win games in Chicago, you know, his record for his career in Chicago is 29-21. and 21. That's a decent record. The reason why the Bears were winning games was because of their defense, their really good wide receiver core, and a pretty good roster overall, and an underrated coaching staff, in my opinion. Uh, Trubisky was just never quite accurate enough, had an average arm, and in Chicago, you need a strong arm quarterback to really push the football through the wind and the snowy weather at times in Chicago. And the thing about Mitchell Trubisky is you could talk about if he got screwed by the Chicago Bears or not. When I told Chicago Bears fans Mitchell Trubisky was the worst starting quarterback in all football, they did not want to listen to me. When in hindsight, I was 100% right at the time. No matter what you think about what happened in Chicago with Mitchell Trubisky, the NFL market spoke as to what they thought about Mitchell Trubisky this past offseason. Mr. Trubisky right now is backing up Josh Allen in Buffalo. He's right now a backup quarterback. There was no market for the guy. Not a single team that needed a starting quarterback 
went after Mitchell Trubisky and gave him a big time contract. Not a single team. Because everyone knows what the tape shows. Everyone knows this guy was overdrafted. Everyone knows he's one of the worst starting quarterbacks in all football. And I actually feel very bad for Mitchell Trubisky because he seems like a great guy. He seems like a guy that really tried his best to become a great quarterback in Chicago. But he was overdrafted. He was way over his head. And quite frankly, he's just not good enough. And that's the harsh reality sometimes when it comes to the NFL. The NFL, when it comes to starting quarterbacks, there, there's a reason there are only 32 starting jobs in the NFL because you have to be sort of not normal to a certain degree to become a franchise quarterback, okay? Those guys are different physically, mentally with their preparation. You've got to have a certain level of talent to become a consistent franchise quarterback. And by today's NFL standards, Mitchell Trubisky just didn't meet the criteria. I feel bad for the guy, but Chicago moving on from Mitchell Trubisky, it was the right move. He was a whiff of a draft pick. And the thing about Chicago is, yes, Trubisky was, yes, you, yes, you did the right thing by moving on from Trubisky, but you can't sell to this fan base Andy Dalton. You just can't. Especially when you potentially could have gotten Deshaun Watson, potentially when you could have gotten Russell Wilson, could have gotten Sam Darnold, a lot of other good quarterbacks. Heck, Tony Bridgewater and Gardner Minshew were on the market for you. You didn't get those guys. You got Andy Dalton. So, if I'm Chicago, in this 2021 NFL draft, I'm training up for a quarterback, especially if I'm Ryan Pace and Matt Nagy because those two guys are on the hot seat and Chicago desperately needs to start quarterback. But moving on from Mitchell Trubisky was the right move in Chicago, and I kind of feel bad for the guy, but he just never panned out, and he probably was never going to pan out. He was over his head from the jump. I now want to shift back to Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers. I double dog dare the Green Bay Packers to trade away Aaron Rodgers. I dare the Green Bay Packers to take on life without Aaron Rodgers. You know, are you Green Bay? Let me ask you a question. Are you truly thinking about moving on from the most talented quarterback in NFL history? A guy that's been the ultimate band-aid for your franchise. A guy that's shown that he can overcome a battle with the blind. Not great wide receivers. Not a great defense. Not a great run game. Aaron Rodgers has shown time and time again, he can carry this franchise on his back despite not having a lot of talent around him. And Green Bay, they don't attract for agents. So Aaron Rodgers, he's the ultimate band-aid. And you're going to let a three-time NFL MVP award winner leave? especially after the year that he had in 2020, having his greatest season yet. The truth, of, the truth of the matter, people, is this. Aaron Rodgers doesn't need the Green Bay Packers. Many teams are going to line up to go out there and sign Aaron Rodgers if he's available, okay? And you could say, oh, well, we got Jordan Love on our roster. Good luck with that. And by the way, I was a Jordan Love fan. I had Jordan Love rated over Tua Tunga Bailoa. I think Jordan Love has some potential. But what Green Bay has to realize is they got super lucky by landing Aaron Rodgers after Brett Favre. You don't go from a top 10 quarterback of all time to another top 10 quarterback of all time very often. The San, the San Francisco 49ers had that situation occur with Steve Young. And Joe Montana, you know, Joe Montana, he he won four Super Bowls. Then Steve Young comes in and wins a Super Bowl and things like that. But it's rare you go from an all-time great quarterback to an even better all-time great quarterback. Because to me, Aaron Rodgers, he's better than Brett Favre. And here's the thing, people. I got to ask you guys a question. If Jordan Love is so good, how come the Packers were in position to draft him? If Jordan Love was so good, how come no one in the top five picked him over Justin Herbert, over Tua, over Joe Burrow? Oh, it's because he's a raw prospect. He's a little bit of a project. And I wonder, if Green Bay didn't trade up for Jordan Love in the first round, who was going to trade up for him? I have no idea who was going to. But look, here, here's the thing. Um, Green Bay, Aaron Rodgers gives you an opportunity to win a Super Bowl every single year. A NFL general manager's dream is to draft a quarterback 
like Aaron Rodgers, A plus arm, good mobility, you know, excellent reading defenses. His processor is unbelievable. Pocket presence, unbelievable. At times, a little bit of a moody leader, but he's a good enough leader. He's a Super Bowl champion. He's the most talented quarterback the NFL has ever seen. And based on the way quarterbacks are lasting longer and longer, like Drew Brees, like Tom Brady, and based on the season Aaron Rodgers just had, I believe Aaron Rodgers has five to six good to great seasons left in him, at bare minimum. I truly believe that, as long as he stays healthy. So, Green Bay, swallow your pride. Potentially look to trade Jordan Love, because it's one of those things where you need to choose Aaron Rodgers over Jordan Love. I dare the Green Bay Packers will trade away Aaron Rodgers because we've seen in the past, without Aaron Rodgers, the Green Bay Packers could barely beat the 0-16 Cleveland Browns. In years past, when Aaron Rodgers has gone down due to injury, Green Bay's been the worst team in all of football. They've been unwatchable, people. So that's how I feel about Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers, a guy that, you know, came out and won league MVP this year. The year after, after the Green Bay Packers did him dirty, and drafted a quarterback in the first round to replace him. So that's how I feel about Aaron Rodgers. The Green Bay Packers, they should not move on from him anytime soon. And you know, here's the thing, people. If I'm Aaron Rodgers, I would not trust the Green Bay Packers organization. You know, I just wouldn't. Because Green Bay, the year after Aaron Rodgers, went on a deep playoff run and was one game away from the Super Bowl, and still playing football at a high level, they drafted his replacement in the first round, Jordan Love. When Aaron Rodgers has said multiple times, I'm not retiring soon. I want to play until I want to play into my 40s. I want to be a Green Bay Packer for life. And that same year, the Packers made no free agency moves. This year they haven't made free agency moves. And to be quite honest with you, Green Bay is putting Aaron Rodgers in a position where if he doesn't win a Super Bowl, he could be out the door. And what Aaron Rodgers must realize about the Green Bay Packers is they are what they are. They're going to field a competitive football team. You know, they're going to they're gonna put a good team out there. They're not dysfunctional. But Green Bay never makes enough big moves to hang with the big dogs, the Legion of Boom in Seattle. The 49ers, the Chiefs, you know, the Patriots, you know, from old when Tom Brady was there. The Buccaneers, led by Tom Brady. They're not good enough to beat those teams. They don't make enough moves to become good enough to beat those teams. And we've seen time and time again, as great as Aaron Rodgers is in the playoffs, he can't overcome the fact that Green Bay is just not better than these teams. When it comes to the playoffs, when the coaching staff is pretty much even, when the rosters are even, and when all you have is a quarterback that, that's been getting you over the hump and beating up on the Vikings and the Lions and the dysfunctional Chicago Bears, beating up on cupcakes, when it comes time to face the real big boys, your team's going to fold. So if I'm Aaron Rodgers, I don't trust the Green Bay Packers organization. I'm looking to move on because I believe there are better and more greener pastures on the other side. Look at what Tom Brady did. Tom Brady left the Patriots. He wins the Super Bowl in Tampa Bay the first year he gets there. Peyton Manning, he left the Indianapolis Colts. He goes to the Denver Broncos. They win a Super Bowl. Peyton Manning dominates. They put a great team around Peyton Manning. They go all in to win Super Bowls. So if I'm Aaron Rodgers, I would not trust the Green Bay Packers organization. And that's ultimately how I feel, truly. Okay, I'm going to wrap up the show by talking about a couple of draft prospects that really sort of intrigued me, you know. One of those prospects is wide receiver out of North Carolina, Deame Brown. I really do not understand why more people are not talking about Deame Brown. Because when I watch this guy, I see nothing but incredible catches. I see him winning jump balls. I see him running past defensive backs. He has really good footwork. He runs good routes, you know. He's really good after the catch. He's a physical wide receiver. And he makes plays down the field. And to me, Deame Brown looks like a first-round wide receiver. And you obviously have the Devontae Smiths of the world, the Jamar Chases of the world, the Jalen Wiles of the world, the Rashad Batemans of the world, the Terrence Marshalls of the world. 
guys that are going to be first round picks at wide receiver probably. I would have no problem with my team drafting Deami Brown in the first round if I need a wide receiver. Deami Brown is not going to be a first round pick. I'm pretty confident because I don't think that he's been talked about enough. I don't think he's gotten the exposure that he's needed to become a first round pick, but I think a team is going to get a steal on draft night if they draft Deami Brown, a guy that is six foot one, but on the taller side of six foot one, you can make the argument that he's about six foot two, weighs about two ten, and he plays like he's six foot three, six foot four. He'll go up and get those jump balls. He's a physical wide receiver, and he made a ton of plays for the North Carolina Tar Heels this past year. So, if you're a team and you need a wide receiver, go get Deami Brown because I believe he has superstar potential written on him. I think he can make an NFL team really happy. So. Deame Brown, to me, is one of, if not the most underrated player in this entire draft, in my opinion. He's probably going to get drafted around the third or fourth round, but I think that he should get drafted at least late first round or high in the second round. I believe he's worth taking that high in the draft. If Deame Brown is not a top 32 pick, there's going to be an NFL team that gets a steal. Now, maybe he doesn't pan out as a player. You know, we, we see it all the time. Some guys don't develop properly. Some guys don't get used properly, and they, then they flame out. Maybe that's the, the case, but De'Ame Brown's a guy that I would at least experiment with. So that's how I feel about De'Ame Brown. He's a really good wide receiver, and he should be getting more buzz in the NFL draft. I now want to talk about Travis Etienne. I believe Travis Etienne the running back out of Clemson that's entering the 2021 NFL Draft, I believe he has a chance to make an NFL team very, very happy, okay? And there's a lot to like about Travis Etienne, like I said. He has he truly has breakaway speed. He has that home run hitting ability, and it's really, truly something to behold. I've seen him in multiple big games versus Ohio State, Notre Dame, you know, these really good teams, just break away for long touchdowns and really play his best football in it in versus the best competition in college football. He also has really good vision. He has a little bit he has a little bit of power to his game. And the thing about Travis Etienne is last year he could have came out in the draft and he potentially could have been the first guy taken as a running back. And that's saying a lot because you had Clyde Edwards Delaire, you had J.K. Dobbins, you had Cam Cameron Akers, you had Jonathan Taylor, all those guys were in the draft last year at the running back position, along with Antonio Gibson. And you could have made the argument that Travis Etienne was just as good, if not better, than all those guys. And I think Travis Etienne has a chance one day to become an elite running back. Now, I do worry about his workload at Clemson a little bit. He was used a lot at Clemson. And sometimes when you get to the NFL, as you age, you know, and things like that, you're not as effective as you once were just because the carries get at times have piled up and things like that. But I really do believe in what Travis Etienne brings to the table. And I believe the Miami Dolphins should be on his radar. I believe the Pittsburgh Steelers should be on his radar. I believe the New York Jets should be on his radar. And I believe the Atlanta Falcons should be on his radar. Four teams, to me, that really could use a boost at the running back position. And I'm excited to see where Travis Etienne goes in the 2021 NFL Draft. The last prospect I want to talk about in the 2021 NFL Draft is Christian Barmore. You know, I really believe in following my own trends and my own beliefs. You know, as an analyst out there, I try to be authentic and try to be my own guy. I see a lot of analysts and, and content creators out there trying to not be authentic, trying to copy other content creators or analysts on television, and that's what they want to do, but I'm going to be authentic. I also really don't listen to a ton of podcasts. I'm not always watching sports talk shows 24-7, like First Take, like Undisputed, even though I do love those shows. I love, you know, Skip and Shannon and Stephen A. Smith and those guys. But when you when you tend to form your own opinions, it, it's, just, it's just one of those things where sometimes I don't need to listen to other guys' opinions because I have my own opinion. But, you know, at times I will look at a couple of mock drafts. I'll listen into what people say. And... I haven't heard enough people talking about Christian Barmore. Christian Barmore is more than worth a first-round pick. I've looked at several mock drafts, even though I like to create my own mock drafts. 
And I haven't seen Christian Barmore in a lot of mock drafts. And I'm here to tell you right now, he's one of the best defensive players in this draft class. And he's arguably the best defensive tackle in this draft class as well. He's more than worthy of a first-round pick based on what I, based on everything I've seen on tape. Christian Barmore is that guy. He's six foot four, 310 pounds, and in 11 games in his final season at Alabama this past year, he had nine and a half tackles for loss and eight sacks. And if you watch the national championship game versus Ohio State, Christian Barmore was the best defensive player on the field for the Alabama Crimson Tide. They got all sorts of good NFL players. They're going to be playing in the NFL one day. Now, the thing you have to realize about Christian Barmore is he does still have a lot of room to grow, which is a good thing because he's already really good and worth a first-round pick. This guy, he could end up becoming a super-duper impactful defensive tackle in the NFL one day. He wreaks habit in the backfield. He's solid at defending the run. I do believe that he could actually get better as a run defender, and he's already a natural pass rusher from the interior. And he's only 21 years old, so he has a lot of room to grow. I believe the Raiders should be on his radar. I believe the Cardinals should be on his radar. I believe if he drops to Tennessee or Green Bay, they should draft him. Christian Barmore is the real deal, and he's going to make some NFL team very happy if he stays healthy at the next level, in my opinion. He could potentially be a bust one day. You know, every player has bust potential. But I'm very confident if Christian Barmore goes to the right team with the right scheme fit, and if he stays healthy, I believe he's going to be a very solid player in the NFL one day. And he has a chance to not just be a solid player, but a great player at the defensive tackle position in the NFL one day. Well, folks, that's pretty much all I have today. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode today. Have a God-blessed day. Stay safe, everyone. And I'm Ghost. Thank you so much for watching this video today. Please also note that the Juice Alert Sports Podcast is not just a YouTube channel. It is available on all podcasting platforms, including Spotify, Google Podcasts, iTunes, and Apple Podcasts. Also, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and share this content with all your friends. This podcast is my favorite thing in the entire world right now. It is my passion. I want more people to listen to this podcast. I really want this podcast to grow. Also, a fun fact about me is that I want to go into the sports broadcasting and media world once I graduate from the University of Toledo, a college in Northern Ohio. I am looking to become one of the next great sports broadcasters and analysts out in the world. And I potentially would like to start my own network if this podcast really truly grows, or if I fall short of that goal, I would love to work for a big time network like ESPN or Fox Sports 1. I am open to all networks. So if you believe in my dreams and you see or hear my passion through the screen, be sure to tell all your friends about the Juice Alert Sports Podcast. Stay motivated, you guys. Have a God-blessed day, and I'm out.